happy Father's Day, and uh, we are glad that you're in God's house uh, being exposed to the Word of God. Uh, we are in Psalm 106. If you'd like to turn there, we will finish our study of that today. It's also a, a great message for Father's Day. It's talking about uh, living a victorious life, uh, and, and what greater thing could a father do for his children, for his family, than to be a victor when it comes to sin, and, uh, and show his children and his family the power of the redemption of God. A uh, great thing. Uh, also, I want to, before we dive into Psalm 106, I want to thank all the VBS uh, leaders and team members. This place was busy this week, so thank you. Uh, you guys hit it out of the park. Uh, just all the young children that trusted Christ, the uh, hundreds and hundreds of people that were here. Uh, it was just a fun week, but uh, are you tired? I bet, yeah. So our, our staff's given, a, uh, they, I think they get tomorrow off, some of the people that served, and uh, so hopefully uh, one day will be enough. Uh, to help them re rejuvenate. Uh, let's pray as we dig into Psalm 106. Father, uh, thank you for the inspired text. Even though we don't know the exact author of this psalm, uh, the man shares his heart. Uh, and from his sharing, uh, we can certainly relate because we have the same kind of struggles. Uh, and we thank you, thank you that you're the same kind of God that worked with him and uh, led him uh, to mature living uh, through the course of his life. And may that be the story of our lives as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I loved to go to the county fair in El Centro, California, where I grew up on the Mexican border. Um, uh, now, this is not a picture of El Centro, uh, California, because <laughs> I, tr I tried to find one from the Imperial County Fair, but it was so long ago, it's not even on the internet. That's how you know you're getting old, when you can't even find stuff like that. Uh, I, I found one header of the entrance to the, to the fairgrounds, uh, but it was a newer shot, uh, so it wouldn't really equate. So our, our church is full of super analytical people. They probably have already Googled this. They probably already know this is not from California, and they're all worried about that. Would you just park your analytical mind for just a moment and just go with the picture? Can you do it? Yeah. See, no one's saying yes. They're like, no, not here. Uh, it's just a metaphor. It's just the fair. Did you like the fair? I love the fair. Uh, so what my mom and dad would do as we got older is they would, uh, you know, turn loose of the authority rope and let you do more things on your own. So uh, they would l let me go to the fair uh, with my best friend, Donnie, Donnie Sundstrom. So um, Donnie, uh, wow. Uh, we did lots of things we probably should not have done. Uh, I don't know if you had a friend like this. Uh, Donnie, between the two of us, was uh, the more adventuresome one. I was a little way more conservative, ask more questions. He would tend to dive into things. And it's a wonder I'm even a pastor today because of some of the things that we did. Uh, but uh, there was a time when, um, when our parents uh, dropped us off at the fairgrounds because we, we were, uh, you know, probably junior hires and didn't drive. So they dropped us off and we we're there like all day that night having a great time. Uh, and there was this one ride that we went on. It, it looked like a Spanish galleon. And it was at nighttime when we went on it. It looked kind of cool. So we, uh, we both got on it, not really knowing what to expect. Uh, Donnie, of course, went in first because, remember, he's the guy that, you know, he'll jump out of the plane first. And so, so he goes in, I go in, and, and as we go in, it gets darker and darker as we're descending down this corridor. And inside the ship, it's just a bunch of maze structures. And so yeah, you can't, I can't see him. I can hear him. Uh, I keep calling his name occasionally, you know, where are you, dude? And so we're moving through this maze. Uh, and then all of a sudden I start hearing this weird whooshing sound. Like a, there was a motor. I could hear a motor humming and there's this whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. There's a whirling whooshing sound. I'm like, what in the world is that? Uh, things got interesting at that point because as I'm walking through the darkness with Donnie, um, who's a few feet up in front of me, I hear, I, <laughs> I hear him as, as he's approaching that whooshing sound. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa! And then he just just went off in the distance. I'm like, what in the world? I'm calling his name. He doesn't answer me. I'm like, what happened? And as I'm walking toward that whooshing sound, I'm like, I had no way I'm stepping into whatever that is. Uh, remember, he's he's the adventurous one. I'm the cautious one. So every so what I found out is I'm kind of filling out the situation. There's a big rubber gasket here, uh, and there's there's a wheel spinning around like a Ferris wheel, uh, like a merry-go-round, but you can't see it because it's pitch black. Uh, and, and there's little boxes on this merry-go-round, uh, and the uh, object was to walk into one of those boxes and ride that thing around and then eventually get off at a, another point uh, and, and in the maze and then walk to safety. <laughs> now, if you're wondering where I'm going, this is a spiritual thing I'm talking about right here. You see, do you see it already? 
Oh, yeah, I descended into the darkness, and then I lost my best friend. So, every, so I'm standing there as this thing's wh- whizzing around me, and every few minutes, Donnie would come by. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, dude, come on, jump on! And his voice would disappear. I'm like, what in the world? Uh, and and then, I did, then he didn't come by anymore. And I'm like, I'm going to be stuck in here my entire life. And so I finally got the courage to step out into the darkness. And once I did, I, I fell into this dark box. And I'm filling the walls. And I was like, oh, this is unbelievable. And it's going around in a circle. And then I thought to myself, I was kind of feeling proud of myself. That I finally did it. But then as I, as I was spinning around, then I'm faced with, how am I going to get off this thing? Do you know what I'm saying? Aren't you a logical person? I got on. And now, how am I going to get off? Because it's in pitch black. And so every few minutes as I'm going around screaming Donnie's name, I could hear him calling me. Hey, man, you know, you know when you see that dim light, man, just step out. <laughs> right. You know, and I'm going around. And I keep telling him, there's a little light, man. Just step out. I'm like, no way, man. I, <laughs> so we're in this argument while I'm stuck in the darkness. Uh, you ever done that spiritually? Uh huh. Yeah, and, and so eventually, I I, got, I thought I'm going to be on here the rest of my life. I want to graduate from high school, so I eventually jumped out at that dimly lit area, and I rolled into a hallway uh, that was you know, really low ceiling. And Donnie was sitting in there. We're cracking up. He's hitting me and everything. Man, you're a chicken, and you know all your friends do to encourage you. Um, but we eventually started crawling uh, through the darkness, uh, and eventually we uh, escaped the ship, as it were. Um, that has now become a metaphor of life, isn't it? Now think about this, uh, because basically, I don't know whoever wrote Psalm 106, um, they understand life to a T, because uh, you could, it, it, Psalm 106 is written uh, from a Christian perspective uh, to Christian people, uh, and it, it's, it's telling them, if you have, if you have uh, in your Christian walk, walked into carnal sin, like the Corinthians did in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, um, you, you've willfully walked into carnal sin and you, you've walked down a corridor of darkness and then you stepped onto the ride, as it were, of darkness. And now you're stuck on this cycle of sin and you're thinking, how am I going to get off of here? Your conscience is bothering you. You know you're not supposed to be doing this. You're not being victorious. The Spirit of God is convicting you. But let's just say that, that Donnie is like God in the hallway calling you, you got to follow me. Well, Lord, I'm kind of, kind of afraid, you know, if I, if I, if I break off this relationship that I know I shouldn't be doing right now. I mean, will I have another one? I mean, what in the Lord? And he's calling your name. So think about Psalm 106 from that perspective. It's like, it's like the cycle of sin. And, and I call it the crazy cycle because we've all done this before because we've all sinned, have we not? See, no one's admitting it. Well, not me, at least not for a year. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, it's a cycle of sin that you, you get involved in something you shouldn't have done as a Christian and you're stuck in that cycle of sin where you want to you get off of it and head to, head to maturity. And so that's what, this, that's what this psalm is about. And we'll just pretend that the, the psalmist is, uh, he, he's telling you three things in this passage you need to do to head toward that light to freedom. So he's like Donnie. So what does he say that you need to do? So we'll review the first thing he said you should do. So he says in verses 1 to 5, he says, there is a right path that you should follow as a Christian. There's a right path. Realize there's a right path. Like there was when I was stuck on that merry-go-round. I was in the darkness, but there was a right path to get off of it. I was just afraid to take the path. And, 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 and Donnie's encouraged me, no, man, it's, it's dimly lit, but it's going to lead you to safety. It's, and that's what he says here. So he says, if you want to live a blessed life, what, what should you do? Verse 3, what does he say? How blessed are those who do two things. They keep justice, and as a lifestyle, they practice righteous, righteousness. And how do you know what justice is and what practice of righteousness is in our messed up, watered down, moral, immoral culture? Uh, well, you read the Word of God. And the Word of God is a standard of what is just and what is holy. And I, and I as a man of God, as a father, uh, I, I attempt to live by this. And when you live by that, you're, it's, it's a blessed life. It's a mature Christian life. But when you get to verse 4 on the right path, he tells you, well, I, I got to admit, I, I have some I have issues. Because notice what he says in verse 4, by way of review, remember me, O Lord, in thy favor toward thy people. Uh, and I need you to visit me with one thing. What's he want? Salvation. He's already saved. But he's like, Lord, I cannot believe the sin I've got involved in as a Christian. I need you to save me from this. Help me. Because sometimes you, like when I'm stuck in the darkness, I wasn't saving myself on that ride. Someone else had to. And that's what he's doing here. He's, Lord, I'm stuck in the cycle of sin. I need you to save me. Help me from what I'm 
this cycle of sin, free me. So verse four, he's, he's introducing to you that he needs salvation. And that might be you um, as a dad, as a Christian man, uh, that leader of your family. Maybe, maybe you, you, you're on the right path and that's awesome. That leads to maturity. But then maybe you're getting real and going, well, no, I've, there's a cycle of sin over here. I'm stuck and I need freedom. So the way you get off is, number one, you realize there's a right path. Number two, you realize that there's a wrong path. You get real and you get honest. And that's what he talks about in verses 6 to 46. He is totally honest with the fact that there's a wrong path, and he identifies with all aspects of said wrong path. And when you read this, you're going to find some semblance of this cycle going on. This we're still reviewing from last week in case you weren't here. You realize this? The older you get, you don't realize we're reviewing. It's just, so it's this, well, this is the first time I've ever been exposed to this. Okay, great. So this is, this is a cycle of sin. So how does it operate? Pretty simple. God does something amazing in your life and you totally know it, right? And because you see what he did, you are like, whoa, God's great. I totally believe him. All right. Then what happens? You get a chance to sin. You rebel. You rebel. And then when you rebel because he loves you and wants you to come back as his child and follow him, he's a good father. So what's he do? He disciplines the son or the daughter who's disobedient. Why? He disciplines you. And then he also forgives you because he's full of grace and compassion and, and mercy when we sin. Uh, and then you'll find him doing something great again in your life and wanting you to follow hard after him. And you then uh, say, Lord, I will follow you. Wow, it's amazing what you've done again. And then you'll get another chance to rebel and you do, etc. That, that's a crazy cycle. So I told you last week, uh, you want to limit um, of these items in your life. Uh, I would say from the top being number one, uh, number three being quick rebellion, you would want to uh, limit uh, items three and four in your life. Because you do not want to stand before the Lord one day and have him tell you something like this. I am so glad you're here. You kept me so busy. <laughs> Every time I do something great, you would believe me for a minute, and then you're back to rebellion. I had to discipline you. You're here. Awesome. Enter the joy of the Lord. Now, you, you don't want to hear this, correct? You want to hear Lord, the Lord say, hey, well done. You know, you stayed on track for most of the time. Awesome. Because that's all about maturity. So with that in mind, uh, we will review. Uh, there's two sections of this passage. Uh, so verses 6 to 46, he's, he's telling you two periods of Israelite history uh, have been replicated in the Babylonian captivity because the psalmist is living in the Babylonian captivity. Uh, and this started in 606 BC in the first invasion of the Babylonians of Israel and carrying them away, three deportations. He, he's with his, his people, his Israel, in Babylonian captivity, writing this psalm. And he's basically saying, I cannot believe we have committed the same kind of sins that our dads did, our grandfathers did, our great grand What were we thinking? Have you ever done that? You've committed a sin and you thought to yourself, I would never do what my dad did. And you did. And he, he said, I can't believe this. So he's going to present two historical photo albums. Uh, photo album number one is the snapshots, six of them, uh, from six snapshots of how Israel fared at different times during the wanderings in the wilderness. And he's going to say, I can identify with all six. And then he's going to switch to the period of the judges uh, and he's going to say in, uh, in verses 34 to 46, uh, let's move from the period of the wanderings, those 40 years in the wilderness. How do we fare? Not well. God was awesome, but we didn't fare well. How are we do in the period of the judges? Hundreds of years of the periods of the judges. How do we fare? Not well. God was merciful. We blew it. And then he says, when I get over to the Babylonian captivity, we're doing the same kind of cyclical sin. God, I need to be saved from that carnal draw. So let's review uh, the two snapshots that we've already looked at. So you with me? And you got to be asking yourself, this is, a, this is a personal question. What would the six snapshots be for my wilderness wanderings? That's the question. Uh, snapshot number one was the Exodus verses 7 to 12. Uh, what happened there? We all know God freed them from Egyptian slavery, used 10 plagues to free them. Uh, they got their backs up to the Red Sea. They began to complain. We're, we're toast. It's over. The Egyptians are going to take us out. What were we thinking? God parts the Red Sea. They go through the water on dry ground. Amazing miracle. They get to the other side. You would think they would never question God again. again. Did they? Yeah. Isn't it amazing? Yeah, they question God again. So God hears them even in their complaint uh, and, and forgives them, saves them, and, 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 and frees them. But they have this penchant for, I would call it godly grumbling. Do you ever do that? You grumble. In other words, uh, you know, might not understand the term. Let's switch it to complaint. You're a complainer. 
See, that's what they did. No matter what God did, they complained. Uh, and, and God still loved them and cared for them. So even in your sin of complaint, where you don't trust them in the great things he's done, uh, he still moves to discipline you, forgive you, and move on to greater things. That's how awesome he is. Uh, I, item number two, snapshot number two. Uh, they got to the other side of the, uh, the, we're still reviewing. It got the other side of the Red Sea. The water goes back. They're free. They're in the desert. And they start complaining about, uh, we need food. There's two million of us. We're going to get food. We need, I don't see a Denny's. I don't, I don't, I don't see a Circle K. 7-Eleven. Where are we going to eat? Uh, well, God will provide. Are you kidding me? And so they, they begin to question God again. So then God, he provides, doesn't he? He sends them manna to eat, bread in the morning, and then he sends them quail, more quail than you, they could all eat. Uh, in fact, he judges them too because they had questioned him. Last thing you want to do is question God. Now, this is a whole other sermon, but there's asking God questions, which I do all the time, things I don't understand. God, could you explain that to me? It's questioning God, and then there's questioning God. Are you kidding me? You did what in my life? Like when, when uh, my best friend Robert Romero uh, was killed in a car wreck right after he graduated, and I'd witnessed to him all of our lives, uh, I was really angry at God. And I questioned God as I walked around the baseball field one night where we played ball, and I had it out with God. You ever done that? And I basically told God where to get off. Not a good idea. But it's that kind of questioning, you know? And they questioned God, and God says, you shouldn't do that. And so he, st he still was merciful to them. He still forgave them, still moved them on to better things. But the psalmist is saying, but, but I'm like that. Hundreds of years later, we still, as a people, and I still, as a, as a man, as a leader of my family, still have that same penchant for questioning God's provision. Snapshot number three. Uh, this is new. We haven't done this one yet. Verses 16 to 18. I call it uh, the coup d'etat. Coup d'etat. What is a coup d'etat? Well, it's a kind of a takeover of one uh, group by another group. Um, now, when you read the book of uh, uh, Psalms in verses 16 to 18, we, we, here's the snapshot of the coup d'etat among the Israels during the wilderness, wilderness wanderings. It says, when they became envious of Moses in the camp, like other people who wanted to be leaders and replace him, uh, and, and of Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord, uh, how'd God handle the insurrection from the coup d'etat? Uh, the earth opened up and swallowed Dathan, the insurrectionist, and engulfed the company of, uh, of Abiram, and a fire blazed up in their company, and the flame consumed the wicked. <laughs> Could you imagine if God did this in D.C.? Wow. <laughs> Could you imagine? Like, would anything be here? I mean, those, you know, guilty of trying to overthrow authority and rejecting power and subverting this and subverting that. And, 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 and suppose it was, you know, God-ordained authority. And just imagine if God just showed up and said, I am so tired of you trying to overthrow or ordained authority that I have put there. I am going to send a localized earthquake. I'm from California. I get it. See that right there? I mean, could you imagine if that was together and you're standing there and you're Dathan or you're Korah, or you're Arbiram, you're one of those three insurrectionists, and you're saying to Moses, man, you're over 80, God's done with you. And Aaron, your sidekick, I mean, come on. You stutter and you can't speak, he's gotta speak for you. What a team, we are better. Well, what's God do? Really? I use broken people. Earth starts to rumble, I've been there before. Earth starts to rumble, some rocks start crunching, ground opens up. They're gone. That sound effect. It was, yeah, it's the best I can do. They're, they're gone. And then there's 250 of their buddies. There's 250 buddies. Could you, you read number 16. There's 250 of them. And th if that weren't enough, a localized earthquake, the statisticians among Israel are thinking, what is the mathematical probability that the ground opened exactly where the insurrectionists were standing? I don't know. You know, they're crunching the numbers. They're gone. And then all of a sudden, fire comes from heaven. I grew up in the desert. You hardly ever see a cloud there. I mean, here it just blows me away. I'm outside in my front yard all the time looking up. It's amazing because I grew up with no clouds. When you go to the desert, if all of a sudden you're in a cloudless day and fire comes out of the sky and localized fire vaporizes like a laser beam from, you know, Star Trek ship Enterprise, and they're just gone, wouldn't you like turn to God instantly at that point? See, God is saying, in a definitive way, I'm going to draw a line in the sand and show you. I'm behind Moses and Aaron. Do not usurp their authority. Stand with them. I approve of them. And if you try to overthrow their leadership, just remember this day. Well, that gets your attention. 
Um, I have met in my lifetime Cora, Dathan, and Abiram on more than one occasion. Who are they? Well, they are the people who think it's God's gift to overthrow a pastoral leadership. And I've met them before. And they usually come to you with uh, statements like this. Pastor, I want to just let you know that I have the courage enough to tell you that I represent a great group of people in the church that oppose your leadership. And you need to do X, Y, Z to make us happy. Blah, blah, blah. They usually threaten you. And I mean, I've been, been down all these roads. And I've had friends who are pastors who've met these same three people. You know what? There's never a massive group of them. It's always a lie. I'm not saying that people can't confront a pastor if he's teaching heresy, et cetera, living immorally. Hey, go talk to the pastor, confront the pastor. But this is, this is Moses and Aaron, God's chosen people to lead the nation. And these people are wanting their authority, their control over the nation. That's all they want is power. And God says, no, it's not about power. I'm going to remove you. What does the psalmist say? He says, Lord, the same desire to control people, I see it in myself. And it's for all, I want to control them for all the wrong reasons. And I'm stuck in the cycle of that, just like my forefathers were. Snap not shot number four. Who can forget the carnal calf incident? Like what happened there? Well, you know, old man Moses is on the mount for, you know, he's been gone for 40 days. They can see the cloud around the mountain, uh, localized cloud around an out mountain and it doesn't ever move. Uh, and there's fire coming out of it and there's rumblings and you can hear, I mean, it's the voice of God. There's a trumpet sounding. It's the angels. It's unbelievable. I mean, you're at the base of it. But he doesn't come down for 40 days. So they begin to think, you know, you can just hear the conversation, can't you? I mean, he's been up there for 40 days. You know, he's over 80. And how long can a canteen last you? You know, I mean, it's over. I mean, he, he probably broke his walker. Cain's probably gone. He's lost up there in the cloud bank. He probably died of dehydration. You know, we got to get back to nation. We got to get the nation together. We got to do something. What do they do? They go to Aaron and tell him, we need to worship somebody. And so we're going to give you all the jewelry that we, we got from the Egyptians. And we want you to, to, to craft us another object of worship, a, a molten calf. Good idea, bad idea, <laughs> bad idea. Notice what it says in verse 19. They made a calf in Horeb and they worshiped a molten image. So they took the God who parted the Red Sea, the great invisible God, and they're worshiping an object of the creation. Thus they exchanged their glory for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God their savior. That's what you do when you sin. You forget God because otherwise he bothers your conscience. They forgot God their savior who had done great things in Egypt, wonders in the land of Ham and awesome things by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them. Remember the cycle of sin? You sin, he judges you. Uh, he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. God says, I am going to take them out. I've listened to their griping and complaint, their unbelief. So many times I'm at the end of my rope and Moses steps in and basically says, Lord, you know, remember your great name. Be merciful to your people. But you can see the, the, the cycle of sin. See, here's the thing. It says in Ezekiel, or not Ezekiel, Exodus chapter 32, which recounts the golden calf incident. It says in verses five to six that they rose up to worship this calf and they rose up to play. Do not think this was volleyball in the sand. Okay, this is not beach volleyball. When it says they rose up to play, uh, the, the Hebrew text is talking about sexual activity. How quickly did they leave the worship of the Almighty God to worship a calf that is not God uh, and thereby break the first two commandments? And then they turn around and engage in sexual activity and disguise it as worship. See, this is what happens when you water God down to a manageable proportion and distort him like happens in Christian churches where they deconstruct God to be who God is not. When you do that, you're doing that to rationalize your sinful behavior over here. They immediately pared God down to a manageable proportion, a calf, worshiped that, and then they immediately said, we can do sexually what we want because this God over here is not as harsh and puritanical as the other one. That's exactly what they did. And what's the psalmist say? God, I, I have the propensity for perversion just like they. And, and you gotta drive that from my life. You gotta help me. That might be you. That you're on that merry-go-round in the darkness going, I, I'm in this perversion. I, and now I see what it is. Because our culture waters this down. It doesn't call it perversion anymore. God does. And he says, no, you need to get out of that. Just come to me. Uh, snapshot number five, the tale of the spineless spies. It's kind of amusing and it's sad at the same time. Uh, it says in verse 24, they, they, uh, when they got to the promised land, they, the Israelites, they despised 
the promised land. You would think you would read that and it would say they couldn't believe they were there. No, they despised it. It says they did not believe in his word, but they grumbled in their tents. They did not listen to the voice of the Lord. Therefore, he swore to them. Notice the cycle. They send. What's he do? He swore to them. He would cast them down in the wilderness and that he would cast uh, their seed among the nations and scatter them in the lands. So this is just a shorter version of Numbers chapter 13. They, they get to Kadesh Barnea and they send out the spies. There's 12 spies uh, to spy out the land. Uh, and they're, they're gone for 40 days and they come back with a report. Special ops team goes out doing recon, in case you're wondering what I'm talking about. And they come back and they give a debriefing. How'd that go? Numbers 13, verse 25. It says, when they, the 12 spies, returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron, the general and his, what would you call him, XO, whatever. And they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron to tell all the congregation of Israel in, uh, uh, in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation. They showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told him and they said, quote, uh, we went into the land where you sent us and it certainly does flow with milk and honey. Uh, this is the fruit. They got it on the poles. Nevertheless, notice the cycle. The people who live in the land are strong. These are their arguments to not do what God wanted them to do. Uh, the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Anak uh, is just another term for a giant, like a Goliath. They're also called in Deuteronomy chapter 3, the Zezumen, uh, tall people, like over nine feet. Uh, they're there. Uh, Amal uh, Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites are living in the hill country uh, near Jerusalem. Uh, he, he says the Canaanites are living by the sea uh, and by the side of the Jordan. So the Canaanites are on the Mediterranean side of the flatlands, and then they're also over there in the Jordan Rift Valley. Um, can't take the land. Then there's an old guy steps forward. Verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses because they're all upset and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it for we will surely overcome it. Wow. Talk about a man of faith. Is that you? God said that's our land. We should take it. He's going to give it to us. Uh, uh, the land is going to spew out the inhabitants because of the evil that they've done before God. He's going to give us this land. And 10 spies said what? It's not happening. We, we, we can't do it. So they didn't believe God's word. Do you do that? Where God's word says X to you? And you automatically rationalize to why that's not going to ever happen? This is no way. I say, I can't do that. It's impossible. Uh, it'd be far better to be like a Caleb. If God is with me, I can do this. That was a Caleb. And that was also Joshua. So think about God. Uh, can, well, can God turn the Nile to blood? Check. Uh, can he make sure that your shoes and your clothing never wear out after 40 years? Hmm, check. By the way, could you imagine wearing the same sandals for 40 years? It's just an observation. Their clothing did not wear out. Uh, can God make sure you have uh, water every day? Yeah. Uh, can he make sure you see the pillar of fire every night in your camp? Mm -hmm. uh, does it move when he wants you to move? Yeah. The, is a cloud bank follow you all throughout the desert? Uh, just you? Uh, that's God protecting you? Uh -huh. Yeah, I saw all that. And you don't think he can give you the land of promise? I mean, go, go read how they took Jericho. How did they take Jericho when they finally got there? Isn't it weird? What's God's battle plan? They just need you to walk around it. You know, blow the trumpets on the last day. No walls will fall down. Don't you know the people of Jericho are going, <laughs> it's not going to work. Nah, no. So God said, if you do this, I can, I can give you victory. So you have to look at the fact that uh, the psalmist is saying, God, when you've told me to do certain things, I have drugged my feet with your word and questioned you like the ten spies. I should have been like Caleb. See, God might tell you, I want you to go on a mission field, but you're, tell, you're saying, oh, I can't do that. This, lot of, this time of my life, the age that I am, my investments, I can't do it. But God's put it on your heart. I want you to go do that. See, if, if God's working in your life, then you're Caleb. I can do it if he's with me. He might want you to swing, switch your life occupation. He might want you to switch universities. Well, you don't understand. I'm in my third year of my program, but, but, but I really can't handle what the professors are doing to my faith. Well, then switch goals. I mean, if, if it's that big of a thing, ask God to show you. If he's opened the door over here, go over there. I mean, it's following what God does. And the psalmist says, Lord, it's so hard for me to follow you. My pinch it is to be like the spies and say, I'm just going to stay over here where it's safe. Uh, what happened to all those people that said we can't do it? For 40, day, 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness until they all died. For 40 years. When they could have walked into the land of promise, God said, you'll not see it. 
which leads to snap snapshot number six. How did their progenitors fare 40 years later? You would think if you saw all this from the life of your, your family, your grandparents, father, etc., you would learn from it. Um, verses 3, 28 to 31 give you the last snapshot of the wilderness wanderings. It says, uh, 40 years later, when the young people are on the mountains of Moab, looking uh, west over the, the, the Jordan Rift Valley uh, by the Dead Sea into Israel proper, it says they joined themselves to Baal Peor. And they ate sacrifices offered to the dead. They provoked him, God, to anger. Notice the cycle. With their deeds, and the plague broke out amongst them because he disciplined them. Then Phinehas stood up and interposed, so the plague was stayed because God's merciful. Uh, And it was reckoned to him for righteousness to all generations. They had the promised land in view. I've I've been in Jordan. This is modern-day Jordan. It was ancient name is Moab. I've been over there in those mountains. And from those mountains, you can stand on those mountains and look back into Israel and see the, the land. It's, it's amazing. At the tor- north end of the, of, the, of the Dead Sea. There's a little town there called Shittim. Uh, and that ancient city is where they eventually are going to cross into the Holy Land because God's going to part the Jordan River at flood tide. But before they get there, will they join themselves to Baal Peor? Well, what does that mean? It means that the two million Jews sitting there in that region start looking at the young Moabite men and women. And you can see how the conversation probably goes. Young guy, your son comes home. We'll call him Yehuda. He comes home. Hey, where were you today? I, well, I was in the Moabite town, you know, checking things out, you know. I mean, God hasn't done anything to get us into the promise. I'm just kind of, you know, bored. You know, I don't have a DVD player. I don't have an iPad. Just kind of bored. Um, and so I, just, I, I headed to, you know, one of their towns, Shatim. Uh, and I, 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 met, I met a really nice girl. She's Moabite. Oh, she's nice looking. And, uh, yeah, well, I've done things with her. I, that I probably shouldn't have done. And, uh, and, and now if I really want to, you know, love her, I, I have to worship her God. So I, I went to the temple too. You know, that, the Baal Peor temple? Uh, yeah, I, I've been there, you know, because, you know, I'll do anything for love. This is exactly what happened. Uh, Deuteronomy 7, uh, God said for the Israelites not to intermarry, intermingle with the people of the land because they would steal their heart away from God, and that's exactly what happened. See, what happened? They, they got into sexual perversion, and they willfully did it when they knew that their <laughs> their progenitors had done this and didn't, they, they didn't learn from it. If you're, I'm talking to the young people today. If your father ever sits you down and tells you, my son, my daughter, learn from me. This is what I did as a young man. Don't do that. Can you look back at your life and not say that God has spared you and been gracious to you and been merciful to you? Indeed, I can uh, because, it, because he is. But that doesn't mean that we haven't made bad decisions. But when you get on that cycle of sin, God says, I will forgive you, I will discipline you, but I want you to move you on to greater things. The thing is to be wise and move on to greater things. And the really wise thing is to listen to those who are wise and learn from them and never get involved in those things in the first place. That's photo album number one. How do they fare with photo album number two, period of the judges? Uh, it's 34 to 36. Uh, this time lasted from 1390 BC to 1051 BC. Hundreds of years. God was merciful. How did they fare? Did they listen to their history and learn from it? Or did they stay on that same cycle of sin, lost in the darkness, not wanting to get off? Well, I'm just going to read it to you, and you can see the cycle. It says, they, once they got into the land, they did not destroy the peoples that the Lord had commanded them. But they mingled with the nations. They learned their practices. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. Uh, They shed in innocent blood. The blood of their sons and their daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan and the land was polluted with the blood. Thus they became unclean in their practices, played the harlot in their deeds. Therefore, notice the cycle, they sinned what God do. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people. He abhorred his inheritance. Then he gave them into the hand of the nations. Those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them. They were subdued under their power. Many times he would deliver them. Why? Because he's patient, he's suffering, He's, he's merciful. He, he, many times he would deliver them. However, they were rebellious in their counsel and they sank down in their iniquity. Nevertheless, he looked upon them in their distress when he heard their cry of God save me. And he remembered his covenant for their sake and he relented according to the greatness of his loving kindness. He also made them object of, of, of compassion in the presence of all of their captors. Uh, who is that? 
Samson. Uh, godly man? Scale of one to 10? 10 being really godly? You guys aren't even putting him on the scale? Okay. Uh, he's a godly man, but he had his moments, didn't he? Because he fell into the same kind of sins, right? Brother Delilah, right? But at the end of his life, he, he comes back to God and says, God, you got to use me one more time. And, and God does. But, but it's that whole thing. God was merciful even to blind Samson uh, and, and uses him one more time to, to, to uh, bring judgment against those who worshiped uh, uh, idols uh, and opposed his people uh, it, because God was merciful and kind even to him. But God sent many, many judges to deliver his people from the cycle of sin. That's his mercy. When you read the book of Judges, that's what God's doing. They, he would do something great. They would rebel. God would judge them. Uh, he would send a deliverer to deliver them, and the, the whole cycle would start over again. So the idea in moving on in spirituality is doing what? Well, being holy more often than you're not. And if you're stuck on the merry-go-round of darkness and you want to head to awesome living, what do you do? Well, that's verses 47 to 48. Now, we'll just read them as we close. What does he say you should do here? I, I know there's a right path. I know there's a wrong path. I'm on the wrong path. What do I need to do? Well, I, I need to utter the right prayer. What would you say are the key words here? Well, for me, I would say it's the first, it's the first phrase, okay? Save us. You can stick your name in there. Save me, Steve, Larry, Donna, whatever your name is. Say, save me, O oh Lord, our God, and gather us from among the nations, because remember they're in Babylonian captivity, and, uh, to give thanks uh, to thy holy name and glory and thy praise. He's saying, save me, Remember me on the merry-go-round in the darkness? What was I doing in the darkness? I'm calling for who? Donnie, hey man, where are you? Donnie's like, hey man, I'm right, here. I'm right here. Next time you come around, step off the darkness and you'll find me. Man, to me, that is a picture of what Psalm 106. You, if you're stuck over here in this darkness, what's God doing to you? He's telling you, hey, 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 hey. I will save you. Just come over here. I will save you. And when I save you from that situation, uh, you will live to, well, to tell all the world about your great God and you will praise my name. You stuck on that, Will? God's calling you today. We have prayer counselors. Uh, you'll see them. They have a little placard. They, they'll be walking all around uh, the church after the service. Uh, you can stop me. You can stop them and just say, hey, I got to get real. I'm that guy. I'm that woman, and, and I, and I want to be saved today uh, and have God redeem me. And for a Christian, this is uh, returning back to your intimacy with Jesus. And for a non-Christian, this is getting saved for the first time in your entire life. Uh, but for a Christian, and specifically what we're talking about today is just, it's just victory. I want to move from, from being in that darkness to coming out and having great victory. What greater thing can you show those around you than the mercy of God to reinstate you and use you in a great way? I hope you have a really great day. It's a beautiful day outside. God's word is so clear and it is so raw, so real and, and so appropriate for the day in which we live. May he give you great victories in your life. Let me pray for you. God, thank you just for the opportunity to, to dig into the Psalter. Even though we don't know the man's name that wrote it, uh, he was quite clear and transparent about his life. May we be real as men and women of God and may we uh, go to the only one who can redeem us from that dark box and move us to greater light and, and living that brings a smile to your face. And may we see many uh, in our church live to move to victory today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Uh, and may his blessings be yours as the father of the family.